Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India When we discuss the technological shaping of technology, we have discussed the critics on the inspirational notion of invention in the form of Ogborn and Hughes. Then for, for the perspective on STS, the economic shaping of technology when we talk about, I mean from the to technological shaping of technology, we will come to economic shaping of technology. The very concept of river silent makes only if a technological system is seen as oriented to a goal. See, uh, in economy, uh, in, in, in the evolution of technology, okay, economics is deeply embedded, economic goals are deeply embedded. Okay. As Hughes pointed out that the technological system is seen as oriented to a goal, to an objective, to an aim it must aim towards certain social needs or economic needs or by keeping the market in mind. Okay? Otherwise, any metaphor uh, of advancing or of backward parts become meaningless. Language, language of this kind is dangerous if it is allowed to slip towards vague talk of the cultural need for a technology. Okay? But, but the notion of a goal can be uh, given a direct and down to earth meaning. Most importantly, most importantly, a system goal is normally talk about economics, but reducing costs and increasing revenues. I mean talk of a system goal is normally talk about economics, about reducing costs and increasing revenues. Electri for, for example, electricity supply systems, for example, have been private or public enterprises and those who have run them have inevitably been concerned above all about costs, profits and uh, uh, or revenues or losses and so on. The, the river salient is an inefficient uh, uh, or uneconomical component uh, for Hughes, for Thomas Hughes and for many practical purposes inefficient means uneconomical. Okay? That is what uh, I mean uh, that all given, given okay, so far as practicality is concerned, practical considerations are concerned. Okay? What is what is efficiency? What is, uh, efficiency means economical, inefficiency means uneconomical okay? for the time being. Uh, we can also argue that uh, efficiency may be uneconomical, inefficiency may be economical. Okay, we will we'll see that in, in the lectures to follow. Okay. I mean technological reasoning and economic reasoning are often inseparable like in the case of Edison's invention of the light electric bulb. Light bulb. Our, our extract from Hughes work okay, uh, demonstrate this in the case of Edison's invention of light bulb. Okay. Edison was um, quite consciously the uh, designer of a system, he intended to generate electricity, okay, transmit it to consumers and to sell them the apparatus they needed to make use of it. To, to do so successfully, Edison had to keep his costs as low as possible, not merely because he and his financial backers wished for the largest possible profit, but because to survive at all electricity had to compete with the existing gas systems. Okay? Crucially, Edison believed he had to supply electric light at a cost at least as low as that at which gas light was uh, supplied. These economic calculations entered directly into his work on the, on the light bulb. A crucial system, uh, a crucial system cost 
uh, reverse salient was the copper for the wires that conducted electricity. Less copper could be uh, used if these wires had to carry less current. Simply, but crucial science uh, is, uh, was available to Edison as a resource. What are those? I mean, Ohm's and Joule's laws from which he inferred that what was needed to keep the current low and the light supplied high was a light bulb filament with a high electrical resistance and therefore, with a relatively high voltage as compared to current. Having thus determined economically as well as uh, 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 or rather economically as much as technologically its necessary characteristics findings uh, finding the correct filament then became a matter of hunt and try. Okay. The precise the 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 precise precise characteristics of the Edison case are perhaps untypical. Even in his time, Edison was unusual in his conscious individual grasp of the nature of technological systems, therein perhaps lay his successes. And since his time, the inventor entrepreneur mm. uh, has in many areas been overshadowed, uh, uh, has in many areas been overshadowed uh, by the giant corporation with research and development facilities. Menlo Park, I mean that was uh, Edison's uh, R and D institution, research and development institution was only an aspect of the beginning of the great transformation brought about by the large scale systematic harnessing of science and technology to corporate objectives. But the essential point remains that typically technological de decisions are also economic decisions. If you, if we produce a technology, if we design a technology which are not, uh, which is not marketable, which consumers are not interested in, then, then uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, it will expire very soon. Okay? If, if technological systems, I mean if technological systems are economic enterprises and if they are involved directly or indirectly in market competition, then technology, technical change is forced on them. If they are to survive at all, much less to prosper, they cannot forever stand still. Okay? Paradoxically, paradoxically, the compelling nature of much technological change is best explained by seeing technology not as outside of society. In, uh, I mean, in the context of uh, hierarchical or uh, linear model as well as interactionist model we have seen. I mean, how science and technology, science, technology and society are, were separate entities. But in the case of uh, uh, embedded model, we have witnessed how uh, science and technology are very much a part of social institution. Okay? That is why, uh, that's why uh, uh, the compelling nature of much technological change is best explained by seeing technology not as outside of society as some versions of technological determinism would have it. Uh, but as in inextricably uh, uh, part of society. That is why I, I, I repeat, if technological systems are economic enterprises and if they are involved directly or indirectly in market competition, okay, then technical change is forced on them. Okay. Technical change is made inevitable and it is, I mean, I mean if, if they are to, if such technological systems if such technological systems are to survive at all, much less to prosper. Okay? Leave them whether they prosper or not, but if they have to survive, okay, they cannot forever stand still. Okay? That is why economic shaping of technology is also important, is assuming greater significance in this context. Okay? Technical change is made inevitable and its nature and direction profoundly conditioned by this. And when and when national economies are linked by a competitive world market as they have been at least since the mid 19th century, technical change outside a particular country can exert massive pressure for technical change inside. The, the dominant, the, the, the dominant uh, way of thinking about the connection between economics and technology okay, is the neoclassical approach, okay, which is based upon uh, the assumption that firms will choose the technique of production that offers the maximum possible rate of profit. Okay? I mean, if you, if you look at uh, basic economics textbooks, 
uh, up to Arthur C. Cecil Pigu, I mean 1910s, 20s, uh, not even 20s up to, uh, by, by, by 1920s, we, uh, we consider it as a neoclassical age, okay. from, from John Maynard Keynes, uh, the general theory of employment, interest and money, we come to know that it is the modern economics. Okay. But uh, this is not a part of the course, I am just giving you some uh, uh, example, whoever may be interested in economics. Okay. That, that, that is why the, the neoclassical approach, I mean the dominant way of thinking about the connection between uh, economics and technology, that is the neoclassical approach, which is based upon the assumption that uh, firms will select the technique of production that offers the maximum possible rate of profit. Despite its uh, apparent plausibility, this assumption has been the subject of much criticism within economics. Okay. The, the issues involved are complex, there is a useful review of them later on, I mean for example, by Elster in 1983, but the hinge upon whether human decision making does or indeed could conform to the strict requirements of the neoclassical model. For example, how can a farm possibly know it has found the technique of production that produces maximum profits? Is it not near reasonable to assume that a farm will consider only a very limited range, a few range from the set of possible options? and will be happy with a satisfactory profit rate okay? or not necessarily, I mean only satisfactory, not maximum. Okay? In the new approaches that have developed within economics, inspiration has been found in the work of Joseph Sumpeter, okay? with its emphasis on the aspects of innovation that goes beyond and cannot be explained by rational calculation. Okay? That is why we, we not only, we at times uh, theoretically uh, speaking, uh, one may say that an entrepreneur and, or an investor must look at the maximum profit. But how can, a, how can an individual, how can an entrepreneur, how can an innovator, how can an investor, how can a farm, how can an industry possibly know when it has found the technique of production that produces maximum profits? We do not know, this is just a, an assumption. Rather, Instead of making such rational calculation, we are trying to look at some kind of satisfactory profit rate instead of maximum profit. Okay? It is found in the, in the works of even Sumpeter, who, who, who was the first one, who was perhaps one of the first ones to uh, offer the theory of innovation in economics and which, which transcends economics, is, which goes beyond the purview of economics. Uh, I mean, we, we sociologists also study uh, 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 Sumpeter in the context of social innovation. Therefore, therefore, when 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 innovation, when uh, social, when innovation transcends the field of economics, it goes to the level of culture, uh, society, polity, and so on. Therefore, we say economic shaping is social shaping. What are the sociological explanations for this? Okay, the alternative. Neoclassical economics of technology thus offers a direct bridge to more sociological explanations. What are those sociological explanations? I mean, costs and profits matter enormously, but in situations of technical innovation, key factors are future costs and future profits. Since uh, there is an element of uncertainty in these, they cannot be taken as simple given facts. Estimating costs and profits is part of what law calls okay, uh, heterogeneous engineering. Okay. What is that heterogeneous engineering? What are these sociological explanations for this? When we, we say heterogeneous engineering, I mean engineering social as well as technical phenomena. That is why whenever we say technology, technology is always socio-technical in nature and social and technical are inseparable. Okay? Constructing that, that, that heterogeneous technology, okay, that is engineering which is social as well as technical okay, or technology which consists of both social 
as well as technical phenomena constructing an environment in which favored projects can be seen as viable. Okay. In this in this context market processes punish those who get this wrong and reward those who get this right, but which out, outcome will prevail cannot be known with certainty in advance nor can it be assumed that market processes will eventually lead to optimal behavior as successful strategies are rewarded by the differential growth of firms that pursue them. That standard neoclassical argument may have validity for static environments in which selection has a long time to exercise its effects, but not for situations of technological change. A strategy that succeeds at, at one point in time may fail shortly thereafter. A strategy that succeeds at one point in time, I repeat, the may fail, may, 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 may fail shortly thereafter and the market's invisible hand may simply have insufficient time for the neoclassical economists optimization to take place. Furthermore, even if sure calculation of costs and benefits or profits and even optimization were possible, the economic shaping of technology would still be its social shaping. Economic calculation and economic laws after all specific to particular forms of society not universal. Suppose, suppose uh, I will I'll, I'll, discuss this I mean whenever you talk about economic calculation or economic laws they are very much context specific to a particular form of society. When we were when, when people were engaged in economic calculation and economic laws in feudalism do we apply the same process of economic calculation and economic laws in capitalism? Are we going to do the same in the context of a socialist state? Okay. I mean, I mean, even if, I mean, even if in all societies people have to try to recon the costs and benefits of particular design decisions and technical choices, the form taken by that reckoning importantly uh, variable. I mean, it is economic calculations, economic laws, they are not universal phenomena, they are context specific, they are, they are specific to particular forms of society or they are, per they are specific to specific, uh, um, they are specific to uh, particular modes of production. For example, technical innovation in the erstwhile USSR, Soviet Union. Okay. People there, I mean people in the erstwhile Soviet Union, this is USSR, they certainly made calculations as to what served their economic interests and plant managers uh, had greater, greater autonomy to make decisions than is often assumed. But the framework of that calculation was different, prices were set by central planners of the state price committee um, rather than being subject to the vagaries of the market as in the west or even in Indian context. Okay. Today, Indian, uh, Indian state does not uh, determine, uh, uh, we do not have price stabilizing mechanism, uh, rather we, we uh, leave it to the vagaries of weather or the vagaries of uh, the corporate sector, okay. if, uh, in the context of medicine, in the context of agriculture and so on. Okay. A price, we might say, was thus a different social relation in the Soviet Union. In its classical form, the system of rewards to Soviet managers hinged upon quantity of production in the short term, fulfilling the norms of the plan in the current quarter, the, the, I mean since 1989 or 90. Okay. I mean the focus on quantity implied that while small technological uh, innovations might be welcomed, larger changes, for example, changes uh, that met, uh, meant elaborate retooling were a, uh, a threat, developing a new product meant um, quoting risks with little promise of commensurate reward if successful. The reforms that the then Soviet, the, the erstwhile Soviet leaders introduced to alleviate this situation uh, often, often uh, made it worse. Thus, economic reforms in 1965 tied the rewards to managers more closely to the profitability of their enterprises. But because the price system was not fundamentally changed, the greatest profits could be earned by concentrating on existing products, huge costs of products and be earned by 
uh, concentrating on uh, I mean which costs of production had fallen well below their bureaucratically set prices. Innovation instead of speeding up actually slowed and the consequences contributed to the eventually uh, uh, a dramatic collapse of, of the Soviet Union as Parrot uh, in, in McKenzie and Walkman's uh, book argues. Okay. Furthermore, even if we restrict our attention to societies in which prices reflect market competition, we find that economic calculation remains a mechanism of social shaping. Okay. Why? No, because it is specific to particular to particular forms of society, to particular modes of production. Economic calculation presupposes a structure of costs that is used at, as its basis, as its foundation. But a cost is not an isolated arbitrary number of pounds or dollars. It can be affected by and itself affect the entire way a society is organized. This point emerges most sharply when we consider the cost of labor, a vital issue in technical change, because much innovation is sponsored, contract driven and justified on the grounds that it saves labor costs. Okay? To take a classic example, because of the different circumstances of 19th century British and American societies, such as the presence of the US, USA of a frontier of agricultural land whose ownership by indigenous peoples was largely disregarded labor cost more in America than in Britain. Hence, uh, Habakkuk in 1962 argued that there was a much greater stimulus in America than in Britain to search for labor saving inventions and thus a different pattern of technological change that we find in two societies in British and American society. Okay? I mean, Habakkuk's claim has in fact uh, proven to be controversial, okay? but the general point remains the way a society is organized, the way a society is instituted okay? and its overall circumstances, its overall conditions affect its typical pattern of costs and thus the nature of technological change within it. That, that individuals are typically paid I mean, I mean, you will you will also find historically, and even today you will find it that that men are typically paid more than women. For example, is clearly not an arbitrary matter, but one that reflects deep-seated social assumptions and an entrenched division of labor, including unequal domestic and child-rearing responsibility. Okay? Don't think that it is arbitrary. I mean, uh, men are paid uh, typically paid more than women. It is not arbitrary. It is. It reflects deep-seated social, uh, deep-seated social assumptions, uh, deep-rooted social assumptions, and an entrenched division of labor, including unequal domestic and child-rearing uh, responsibilities. The different costs of men's and of women's labor translate into different economic thresholds uh, for machines that have to justify their costs uh, by elimination of men's or of women's tasks a mechanism of the gendered shaping of technology that deserves systematic study. Uh, I mean, um, we must discuss this when we come to technology and gender uh, within social shaping of technology. Now, let us, let us when we say that uh, technical innovation includes economic calculations, economic laws, which are after all specific to particular forms of society or modes of production, they are not universal. Okay, technical, uh, for example, technical innovation in the uh, in the erstwhile uh, Soviet Union, uh, USSR. Then, what is the nature of the state so far as technology is concerned? I mean, that's why that's how we come to a point of technology and the state. From I mean, social relations. Okay, social relations uh, then affect technological change through the way that they shape the framework of market calculations. But the market is far from the only social institution that shapes uh, technological change. From antiquity onwards, states have sponsored and shaped technological projects, often projects on a vast scale. That is why uh, we can, we can uh, look at any uh, 
projects on dam, projects on electricity, projects on water, projects, I mean, all, all on, a, on a large scale technological projects. Okay? Uh, if you look at, uh, if you can re slightly recall what we discussed uh, in the political control of technological systems, uh, the work of Louis Mumford, authoritarian technology and democratic technologies. Authoritarian technologies are very often proposed by uh, are funded by, shaped by, sponsored by uh, the state. Okay? Mumford provided a classic account of this. Let me quote him. I mean, he said uh, that authoritarian techniques, I mean, it begins around the fourth millennium BC in a new configuration of technical inno invention, scientific observation, and centralized political control. There are three things here. Technical inno invention, one, scientific observation and centralized political control by the state. The new authoritarian technology was not limited by village custom or human settlement sentiment. Its Herculean feats of mechanical organization rested on ruthless physical coercion, state coercion, okay? forced labor and slavery, which brought into existence human powered machines that were capable of exerting thousands of horsepower. Okay? 17th and 18th century European states were interested in technical progress as a source of uh, greater uh, national power, population and treasure. Okay? This, this mercantilist framework, then mercantilist framework, what is that mercantilist framework? Now, the state and military technology, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean uh, uh, greater national power, population and treasure. Okay? This, this mercantilist framework carried different implications for the shaping of technology. Uh, I mean, state and military technology when we talk about, I mean, it is the war or, and the, or the threat of war. Uh, they act coercively to force technological change with defeat, uh, uh, the anticipated punishment for those who are left behind. I mean, when I say this mercantilist such mercantilist framework of having greater national power, population and treasure carried different implications for the shaping of technology than did straightforwardly capitalist judgments. While in England, there was strong commitment to labor saving devices in France, the mercantilist notion that work must be found uh, um, for the largest number of hands prevailed. As late as 1784, the brocade loom was praised in France uh, because it employed twice as many workers as the plain cloth loom. Okay? It being argued that it was the benefit of labor which remains in the towns when the products have left that, uh, uh, left, uh, that is the real product of the manufacturers. The, the, the single most important way that the state has shaped technology has been uh, through its sponsoring of military technology. That is how we come to state and military. War and its threat of uh, or the war of or, or the threat of war or, or war and its preparation have probably seen um, uh, have probably been on a par with economic considerations as factors in the history of technology. Like, uh, like you will find that um, uh, like international economic competition war and the threat of war act coercively to force techno technological change with defeat uh, the anticipated punishment for those who are left behind. Okay? Military technology is the subject of uh, a subject okay, that uh, uh, I mean the military technology uh, when we talk about it is the extent to which military concerns have shaped civilian technology. Military interest in new technology has often been crucial in overcoming what might otherwise have been insuperable economic barriers to its development and adoption and military concerns have often shaped the development pattern and design details of new technologies. Okay? We, can give, we can keep on giving such, such um, uh, uh, examples. Okay? I mean, in the case of nuclear power, I mean, state interests closely shaped reactor design, 
atomic weapons and in gaining autonomous national and energy supplies. We can give case studies like uh, air transport, where we will find design of 1930s British and German civil airliners reflected the ways in which those countries airlines were uh, chosen instruments of foreign and imperial policy. Okay, that is how colonialism operated for a, um, uh, for a long time and through military technology colonialism ruled us, ruled India for almost uh, a couple of centuries. In the context of electronics, you will find military, I mean of the US need and support for the development of semiconductor, microchip, digital computer and so on. Okay. That when we start to, I mean these are, these are certain ways to look at the, the nature of path dependence of technological change. Okay. When we look at theorizing the relationship between technology and society, okay, a major development in the social studies of technology since the first, uh, uh, I mean since the first edition of the uh, uh, of such work, I mean uh, that science, technology and society studies reader came up uh, in 1985 is the flowering of the theoretical work on the relationship between technology and society. Two theoretical approaches which were quite nascent in the mid 1980s have particularly close bearing upon the social setting of technology. Two, what, what was, what were, what were those two in the mid 1980s? Okay, that was first is the social construction of technology perspective developed by Uibe E. Biker and Trevor Pinch uh, and represented here in a succinct extract from the work of Pinch and his colleague Ronald Klein. Its focus is on the very phenomenon that has been underestimated in the debate over path dependence. What is that path dependence in the context of social construction of technological systems uh, is concerned? That is the interpretative flexibility of technology, interpretative flexibility of technology. Then what is that interpretative flexibility? I mean Biker and Pinch, they discussed the construction of a bicycle. Okay? We can we can look at anything. I mean, we can look at a refrigerator. Okay, we can look at a television set. We can look at many many. We can look at a computer. Okay, we can look at a power loom. We can social construction of technological system. I mean, what what is that interpretative flexibility? Interpretative flexibility refers to the way in which different groups of people involved with a technology can have different understandings of that technology, including different understandings of its technical characteristics. This is important. Suppose, when you look at a particular dam project, particular project on dam, okay, suppose Subansiri dam in northeast. Okay. I mean that particular dam elicits different responses from different stakeholders. Okay. It includes different understandings from different stakeholders, different social groups, economic groups, political groups, cultural groups, pressure groups and so on. Okay. Biker and Pinch's focus is not just on the symbolic meaning of technologies, okay, but includes also variation in criteria for judging whether a technology works or not, whether or not a technology works. The Biker Pinch social construction of technology approach, I mean the Scott approach draws heavily upon earlier work uh, applying a sociological perspective to scientific knowledge. Those developing the sociology of scientific knowledge such as David Bloor in 1976 sought symmetry of explanation. We have already discussed Bloor, I mean when we discussed um, the externalist characterization of the relationship between science, technology and society, earlier notion was that uh, no, uh, all knowledge except scientific knowledge is socially and culturally conditioned. Whereas, Bloor in 1976 pointed out that no, it is not correct, all knowledge including scientific knowledge is socially cost. Okay. Bloor, what, what did he argue? I mean Bloor argued that, argued against the then prevalent notion that true scientific knowledge was the result simply of unaided human rationality and causal input from the material world instead of invoking social processes 
only when the credibility of false belief had to be explained. Bloor argued that proper explanation of all knowledge true or false, true and false both I mean typically would involve recourse to material input, psychological processes and social processes as well. There are, there are, uh, there are few more difficult and more contentious topics than uh, what sociology of knowledge symmetry would be taken to mean and certainly not all subsequent authors employed the term in the way Blue did. For Biker and Pinch in the context of Scott, symmetry means avoiding explaining uh, the success or failure of technologies by whether or not they work. For them, machines work because they have been accepted by relevant social groups. Okay? Who are those relevant social groups is also a matter of political choice, political selection. Okay? To our minds, this formulation underplays the extent to which okay, for, for uh, Walkman and uh, uh, McKinsey, okay, such, such, formula, for the such formulation whether they work or not for them, I mean for, for Biker and Pinch uh, machines work because they have been accepted by uh, relevant social groups, machines do not work because they have not been accepted or they have been rejected by relevant social groups. To, to, uh, to for, for McKinsey and Walkman, such formulation underplays the extent to which technology always involves interaction between human beings and the material world, but they wholeheartedly uh, agree that historians and sociologists of technology should consider the fact that machines work as something to be explained rather than take it for granted in our explanations, in their explanations. In particular, explanations of success or and failure in terms of the intrinsic superiority or inferiority of technologies are suspect because of the path dependence of the history of technology. That one type of machine works better than the alternatives may reflect their histories of adoption and improvement rather than any intrinsic uh, unalterable features of the technologies involved. The extract from Clean and Pinch's article ends by citing some of, I mean, I mean, we can, we can uh, go on and on uh, on this. Uh, it is, I mean, you see, uh, it is important. The first is the issue of structural exclusion. Who are the relevant social groups or not uh, is a matter of political choice, political selection as we discussed. Okay. I mean, it is, it is the issue of structural exclusion um, uh, in, the, in the Scott approach, what we find that uh, the social groups relevant from the point of view of a particular technology are typically identified empirically in historical research. For example, uh, we can identify what social groups are relevant with respect to a particular artifact by noting all social groups mentioned in relation to that artifact in historical documents. Suppose, when power loom was introduced, when hand loom was in full flow, when power loom was introduced, okay, who were those relevant social groups who accepted that no power loom should work, no more hand loom. Okay? That, that relevant uh, social group, the, the, the very construal of such relevant social groups is a matter of political choice. Okay, or is statized in nature. I mean, it is, it is also historically conditioned. The trouble of course, is that the exclusion of some social groups from the processes of technological determin uh, te technological development okay, may be such that they have no empirically discernible influence on it or, and are not for example, mentioned in documents concerning it. This for instance, will often be the case with women ethnic minorities and manual workers. When I say manual, I mean hand loom or power loom, the hand loom is done manually, right? Power loom is done by machines. Okay? And those uh, uh, manual workers who are not skillful, I mean who are not familiar with uh, or who are not being made familiar with, uh, with the sophisticated power loom, uh, um, they will be left out they will be socially, politically, economically excluded, culturally excluded. Right? In this case, 
it would it, it would be most foolish to assume that gender is irrelevant to the development of a technology just because no women were directly involved and the masculinity of the men involved was never mentioned explicitly in discussion of it and analogous points hold for class and especially ethnicity. The point is a difficult one. We would not claim to have a formula for how to analyze the effects on technological development of structural exclusion, but it needs always to be kept in mind. The influence of politics upon weapons technology is for example, by no means always the direct one of technologists compliance with explicit political demands. Okay? And then uh, it can also take the indirect form of the efforts of technologists to keep their technologies as black boxes opaque to scrutiny from the political system. The developers of the US submarine launched ballistic missile systems for instance carefully avoided design options that might lead to political controversy uh, and congressional involvement however attractive these options seem to others. Uh, this is what McKenzie wrote in 1990. The other problem with the original formulation of the Scott approach is, the, is one that also manifested itself in the first edition of that book, I mean handbook of the STS reader that is the reciprocal relationship between artifacts and social groups. The theoretical perspective uh, that has done most to sensitize the field to this issue is what is often called the, the second theory, theoretical approach that we witnessed these days, I mean in the, in the, 19, uh, in the mid 1980s. It is the actor network theory propounded by Bruno Latour, Michel Callon, uh, Akrik, John Law and so on. Okay? And, uh, and it represented, I mean, I mean actor network theory represented here by, by uh, the extract from the work of Latour and uh, I, mean, I mean what we are trying to do here that uh, we will be looking at mostly Latour's work uh, on actor network theory, laboratory life and others, even Callon's work, Law's work and so on. The key point can be conveyed by, by, by in the way let me put it this way that uh, in, in, the, in that in the, in the 1985 uh, first edition of that reader or handbook on science, technology and society studies uh, that uh, it was thought that it was thought uh, largely of the social shaping of technology in terms of the influence of social relations upon artifacts. The problem with this formulation is its neglect of the valid aspect of technological determinism, the influence of technology upon social relations. To put it in other more accurate words, it is mistaken to think of technology and society as separate spheres influencing each other. I mean technology and society are mutually constituted. The reason why from the varied and influential writings of Latour, I mean why uh, we, are, we are trying to, to, to look at uh, actor network theory, it is, it is an important, I mean both Scott as well as ANT are, are important theoretical approaches uh, to study the relationship between technology and society. I mean, I mean what uh, uh, to, to, to uh, I mean to sum up the thing uh, uh, quickly about um, uh, Scott and NT that Scott approaches, uh, I, I mean Scott focuses interpretative flexibility of technology uh, which refers to the ways in which different relevant social groups involved with a technology. Uh, can have very different understandings of that particular technology including different understandings of its technical character. The, the critique to such Scott approach is the exclusion of some social groups from the processes of technological de development and the reciprocal relationship between artifacts and social groups. Okay? I mean we have already discussed this. Then what is this ANT, actor network theory? I mean actor network theory. Okay? I mean it dwells upon material resources, artifacts and technologies such as walls, prisons, weapons, writing, agriculture uh, are all are part of what makes a large scale uh, society feasible. The technological instead of being a sphere separate from society or social 
is part of what makes society possible in other words a constitutive of society. What is the critique to NT, NT approach that the NT approach calls for symmetry in the analytical treatment of human and non-human actors. The material world is no simple reflection of human will and that one cannot make sense of the history of technology if the material world is seen as infinitely plastic and tractable. Okay? Coming to coming to constructing gender, constructing I mean we can we can uh, look at many many things uh, that uh, how do we construct gender, how do how does uh, feminism examine technology, how can or how technology is constructed through gender uh, is shaped by gender. Okay? We will discuss this in the lectures to follow.